Hey everybody, Casmo here, and today I'm joined by Matt Wagner. He's the senior producer at Eagle Dynamics. Uh, I, I guess really just kind of the voice of DCS is the way I would kind of picture you. So how you doing, Matt? Good. Thanks for having me over, Casmo. Yeah, well, I, I joke about the, the voice, but I remember playing mm -hmm. the old A10 campaign, and mm -hmm. and there was a guy, and then a few years later, there was a video, and, and you were narrating. I was like, hey, that's the, that's the yeah. A10 guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I imagine you get yeah. that a lot, but... One of the many hats I wear is uh, doing a lot of the voiceovers. Yeah. Do you still get to do any of that or is it pretty much no? Uh, a fair amount still. So actually, even in the current version of the game right now, I still have the voice of the JTAC. Um, okay. But moving forward, we're actually doing a, um, a whole rewrite, essentially, of our radio command system. Hmm. And uh, we'll be redoing all the voiceovers. So we're actually going to be shuffling these up a bit. So I'll probably take the role of the player pilot. Hmm. And we'll have someone else come in for the JTAC. Um, but yeah, that's that's going to be a very extensive piece of work. But I think people will really be happy with all the stuff yeah. we'll be adding to the new comm system. Not just the okay. ATC, but you know, tons of call signs and tons of new brevity calls. And um, you know, both for fixed wings and helo, of course. So, um, but yeah, just uh, voiceovers is just, you know, again, one of the hats these days. Sure. Um, are you going to have any, like, I know a lot of these third party campaigns, they get like various YouTubers and stuff. You guys doing anything like that or. So for me, uh, every now and then, um, I'll pop in and do a cameo, uh, voiceovers mm -hmm. for some of the third party guys. Mm -hmm. Um, but for us, mostly uh, for the campaigns, we're relying more on the third parties now to do it. You know, mm -hmm. one, uh, they had the bandwidth to do it. Uh, in years yeah. past, you know, myself and a couple other guys on the team, we had the bandwidth to make these campaigns. Uh, but now with uh, so many irons in the fire in DCS with the entertainment side and the professional side, we just don't have the time anymore. Uh, and the other half is, you know, these third party guys, uh, they just do outstanding work much better yeah. than I can do now. Uh, in fact. <laughs> so it's kind of a win win. It's, um, it's a great opportunity for uh, really talented guys out there who know how to use the mission editor or creative and can make a few extra bucks. And, uh, you know, to, to plug the point, um, we're always interested in bringing new third party guys to make campaigns um, that can do really good quality work. Well, you know, I was going to ask you about that later, but since we're kind of talking about it now, I mean, what does it take for somebody who who wants to to get into that? They just shoot you guys a note and kind of have to give you something as a preview. Like, how does that work? Right. So um, they'll contact myself or one of our community managers, and what we usually ask is to provide uh, a sample of the first three missions of the campaign. Mm -hmm. So it demonstrates their ability to work in a mission editor, doing really good scripting, uh, quality voiceover work, uh, really high quality briefings, both in the text as well as the images. Uh, they also have to be able to put together um, a really good um, marketing video, screenshots. So there's actually a, a punch list of requirements that review in order to decide whether or not it's a campaign that we can publish. Yeah, well, it kind of goes to your point that we were talking about right before we went live is uh, uh, the passion, right? Because just like you said, that it takes a lot to to build these campaigns. I was talking mm -hmm. to the Baltic Dragon and Reflected oh, yeah. and just the the amount of effort. Like I knew it would take a yeah. while, but I didn't realize mm -hmm. the amount of time. Yeah. And for you guys to kind of distribute your personnel to do that has got to be a, a huge drain. It really is. And those are classic examples of guys who have really took the bull by the, the horns and done some outstanding mm -hmm. work on the campaigns. And it's been good for the us. It's been you know great for them. It's just been a win-win overall. Yeah. And of course, it's been awesome for the consumers because they have sure. you know that much more content to play. And um, you know, until we have the dynamic campaign out there, um, obviously that's kind of the focus of the gameplay at the moment are the single missions and a lot of the third party campaigns. So these guys you know, provide a wealth of content um, at this stage of the product. Well, since you brought it up, dynamic campaign, of course, that's been something that's been buzzed around for a, a long time. What what can you tell us about that as far as plans and timelines, anything like that? Right. So when we whenever we've done polls to our consumer base of you know what feature they want most. In DCS, um, geez, I think 99% yeah, of the times, dynamic campaign is at the very top. Mm -hmm. And, you know, myself, Nick, Kate, all of us uh, uh, 
at the team, we realized that it's it's a high priority. But in order to do it, uh, we wanted to do it right. And there's a lot of expectations out there, you know, particularly based on uh, other products out there of a bar that we want to reach, if not exceed. Hmm. And it's not just a matter of wanting to do it. It's also, you know, having the resources to do it. And equally as important is finding the right people to do it. You know, finding an engineer to actually create a dynamic campaign system was very difficult, but we found actually a really good guy who's incredibly talented that's been working on it now for a couple of years. And knock on wood, by the you know, end of this year, we'll actually be going in to test with it. And the key with this is, as we I think we mentioned in the newsletter, is we we don't want just um fully mission based. We want to actually have a background of economics, of supply, of mm. morale, uh, in many ways, an RTS game working behind the scenes that then drives the air tasking order. And, uh, and then within that, you have two you know, large elements. The, the first one, of course, is the tool to create the dynamic campaign. And that's what we're really uh, involved with right now, actually, I'll be doing some more testing on that later today. And then the second part, of course, then is creating the UI system and the logic for the player end of, you know, being able to jump in a campaign, say, here's the map, here's the basic scenario I want, uh, here's the type of missions, uh, here's the different uh, slots in the ATO I can jump into, um, you know, and having a very intuitive and fun way to go through the campaign is, you know, equally as important. So there's, sure. uh, you know, a huge amount of work here uh, still, but it's been probably one of, you know, the highest priorities in the company because we recognize that it's such a high priority for our customers. Sure. What is the, maybe this is a, a weird question, but I mean, what is the number one challenge in creating something like that? Because and I'm, I'm I'm comparing apples and oranges right now, but I'm just doing it to just kind of put some context. You know, in the early days of flight simulation gaming, you did kind of have these dynamic campaign generators, and there wasn't much to it. I mean, you're just you're defining a lot of extra mm -hmm. uh, kind of stuff to it. But what are you guys finding is the number one challenge in building a, a dynamic campaign generator that achieves your goals? Probably more the strategic AI of having to be smart mm -hmm. enough saying. Um, so this side has, you know, these production capabilities to create these type of systems. You know, how do I then transfer uh, these assets along these logistical routes to, to mm -hmm. you know, this node that need to be distributed in this way? And if the node is cut in this way, how is it reroute through a different way in this circumstance of having all the different logic in place to make that RTS level uh, happen? in a yeah. very realistic and logical way. Okay. Yeah, I can see that being, you know, I, I don't know how much or ever if you've messed around with that liberation uh, campaign generator I that have. somebody created. Yeah, I really, really enjoy that. Yeah, it's really cool. But one it thing is. I've noticed, and it kind of goes with what you're talking about, is once you kind of eliminate the first, you know, major node, right. it, it's all, it's dominoes at that point, right? You've already pushed over the first domino. And the mm -hmm. other guy can't, you know, the AI cannot recover from that, at least in my experience. And economically, you've you've overwhelmed them. And then it's just, well, now it's just right. rinse and repeat and go to the same one. So but right. what you're saying is that's that challenge that you're trying to get around is how do I how do I make this more compelling so that I do want to keep Absolutely. playing after the third mission or, you know, whatever. Absolutely. And another big element that goes hand in hand with that, which I think, um, I think the guys who are developing the liberation campaign are probably beating their heads against is the AI element of it. Of, yeah. You know, of when you, you task these AI flights to do task A, B, or C for them then to carry out, out those tasks in a, effective and logical way. Yeah. And obviously right now it's no surprise that there's some challenges in that regard. So that's another big element we need to address is to make sure that when we do have the ATO and the AI is assigned those tasks, that the AI can actually carry out those tasks, whether it's a, you know, a, a single sortie or a large alpha package all working together, there's right. an equally large AI aspect that needs to be accomplished as well. Okay, so kind of drifting into the AI discussion, you know, that's one of those things that I think I think DCS gets beat up on a little bit for AI. I know I beat up on it, you know, kind of tongue in cheek, but you know, I 
I struggle to think of really any video game or anything that the AI doesn't just do wacky things. Right. Um, what are you guys finding is the the biggest challenge, and what is the number one thing that you're you're focused on with AI as far as the enemy and how they're acting, how they're shooting, things like, like that? Well, so for AI, we have to divide it into different areas. Uh, obviously, first you have like your kind of more basic BFM AI. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have more of your beyond visual range AI. Then you have your ground AI. You have your ATC AI, and so on. And we have to take um, these in different chunks. And actually, have even different engineers assigned to those different levels of AI. Mm -hmm. um, right now, a lot of our AI work is actually uh, over the past year or so been focused on supercarrier. Uh, because the AI there for supporting and launch recovery operations has been pretty intense. And there's still some additional work to do on that. Um, once we get that wrapped up, then probably a lot of the AI work will be back on some more of the BFM side and also a lot back on to what I was talking about earlier about supporting the dynamic campaign structure. Um, so the main thing that I want to invite you here to talk about, of course, is the helicopter side of things. Uh, so we're looking at 2021 as... I don't, I don't know that I want to call it the year of the helicopter, but we're certainly getting a lot of, you will. Okay. So that is the definitive answer. Okay. <laughs> so, well, I guess what I, what then that leads me to believe is it, beyond this year, do we mm -hmm. have broader plans for more helicopters? After this year? Hmm. Yes, but I can't talk okay. about that yet. I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> even outside of what we've already announced, we also have other helicopters planned actually even in Okay. Okay. So th we just had the hind you know, it's Sunday, uh, two days ago, we had the hind announced for pre-order, which I was surprised, uh, and, and, and went ahead and bought, um, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, is this going to be an early access or is this a full, like, like what's the status on this thing? It'll be early access. And, okay. um, so even on the, uh, store page. I think we've actually have listed all of the features that we're planning on early access. And there's a separate right. list of the items that will be coming after early access. And if I remember right, um, excuse me if I get this wrong a bit, um, some of the items coming after early access will be um, uh, a core door gunner on the side, hmm. uh, more advanced uh, AI system, uh, whether you're in the pilot seat or the CPG. Uh, some different weapons, I think different uh, warheads for the anti-tank system. Uh, also be adding the R-60 earlier missile, which could also, um, in fact, be used against ground targets like the Soviets did in Afghanistan. Um, off the top of my head, I think, if I remember right, those are some of the additional items coming after early access. Sure. So, but for that actual release, it's going to be pretty much mission ready because I, you know, oh, and yeah. I think you and I talked about this so. before, you know, the F-16 early access release, there's some that say, well, it just wasn't enough for me. I enjoyed it. You know, the F-16, I got it day mm -hmm. one. I, I, I had fun with it, but um, not everyone has the same, same results. Well, and I, th I think we'll be the first to agree and Nick and Kate as well, that we did stumble on that. Um, mm -hmm. There were items of the F-16, you know, for example, no damage model. That was right. Uh, that was a, that was a drop ball. Uh, and, uh, that was a big lesson we learned to slow down. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a case where we had a deadline um, to not step on other product releases and mm -hmm. we pushed it out too fast. Um, we should have slowed it down. We should have pushed it back because it just wasn't ready. And okay. uh, that's on us. How much did COVID affect the release schedule of the Hind and, and work on the Apache? A bit. Um, you know, obviously much of our team uh, for a, a long period is working from home. There's always a transition period of mm. uh, sorting that out. So we did definitely lose some productivity, but it wasn't um, a, a huge factor. Uh, it definitely did push us back a bit, but uh, not outrageously so. So when we talk about early access, because um, I know guys who are just, you know, they, they've just dug their heels and they say, I'll never buy anything early access. Right. For me, and I think I think I share probably a majority of people's thoughts on it. I, I never buy something early access, at least for DCS and, and wonder, well, gee, I wonder if this will ever get completed. Like, I, I guess maybe I just go into it with the expectation that, yeah, I think these guys are going to come through and I don't feel that way for every other early access thing that I ever get. Mm -hmm. Um, but for you guys, is there a criteria now, um, that you've established say, okay, in order for something to be early access, it will hit X, Y, and Z. So 
when we define an early access, we want to have a, a, a feature set that we believe the product will be in a good playable state and provide a lot of enjoyment. Um, now, obviously that varies widely between the aircraft types. You know, again, the Hind is a good example of uh, providing an early access feature list that we think is going to be very playable and a lot of fun to play. Hmm. Um, so as long as we can keep to that and I think the key here is very clear communication of what's going to be in that early access and what's going to be after the early access. And again, that's one of the lessons we learned from the F-16 was we had a breakdown of communication and we didn't manage those expectations. And that's what we need to do in the future. And I think we have been doing since then. Sure. We need to continue to do. And you know, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, early access is very much a choice. You know, Some yeah. people very much enjoy it and they want to be part of that development process. Uh, before we did early access, um, we would just get daily many, many, many messages saying, I want to play it now. Even <laughs> if it's a buggy mess, I want to play it now. So um, that was one of the motivations, but also it allows us you know, to have the cash flow to support the development of the product and other products in the meantime. Hmm. Whereas when you just you know wait till the very end to release it, it's it's a bit more problematic in terms of you know funding that development mm -hmm. so the way we look at it is a it's a win-win for most users and definitely for us but we do recognize that early access is not for everyone yeah. you know some people obviously want to have it you know bug free and complete when they purchase it and you know they, they will get to that point mm -hmm. um it may take longer than they wish. Um, obviously, the Hornet and the Viper are very complex aircraft. And we recognize that um, a lot of our customers wish the development pace was a bit faster. And uh, we, so do we. It will get there. And um, you know, despite being early access, it doesn't mean that uh, it will not ever get done. It will get done um, in, in due course. And you know, another issue too is, you know, of course, with you know several projects, you know, Viper, Hornet, Apache, uh, there are limited resources. So we had some issues in the past where, um, particularly with the F-16 and the Hornet, where we actually had two different development teams to develop those products, and we actually had you know, people working along those lines. But then, in order to hit release. Uh, dates, you know, we had to shuffle people around and there was some, again, some miscommunication there that uh, should not have happened, but it did. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, despite being early access, it, it will get done. And for those who want to take part in, you know, helping develop that product and testing and um, quality control and just having fun seeing it, it grow, then, you know, I hope they can take part. Uh, but again, for those who, you know, might get frustrated about bugs, about incomplete features, then I would suggest waiting. Right. Okay. So for, for the hind, we've got it out on pre-order now, uh, which is signaling that at least to, to the average person that it, it is on schedule. It is. Uh, I believe you guys said Q2. Yep. Um, what challenges are you guys facing with it right now in those final stages? I wouldn't say so much challenges, but uh, probably the remaining items are going to be the uh, new AI system, mm -hmm. uh, even more so the graphic uh, interface to do this. Um, a big thing we want to be able to do with the AI system, uh, not just for helicopters, but for um, aircraft fixed wing in the future, is not have to go to key commands or a mouse or anything to deliver radio communications. Hmm. Uh, we want to be able to make it as hands-free as possible. So that's one of the big things we're working on right now to make it um, you know, that much more uh, easy to use and then also integrate that, of course, with our uh, integrated uh, voice uh, communication system. Okay. Uh, for all helicopters, really, except for the K-50, for obvious reasons, multi-crew is probably the number one thing that people talk about, at least in the mm -hmm. helicopter circles. Mm -hmm. Where are we looking at that across the board for helicopters? So we've got it with the Huey. How, how long until that's implemented across the board? So the plan is now that we have a lot of the kinks worked out for the helicopter uh, cooperative multiplayer, the other helicopters will be much more straightforward. 
uh, I wouldn't say easy, but easier. Mm -hmm. So the plan now is that anytime we release a new helicopter, whether it's a Hind, an Apache, uh, so on, that right out the bat at early access, we will have that multiplayer co-op support. Okay. It, what What is the challenge with with that? Because, you know, we've got these other fixed wing aircraft that they don't seem to, you know, I don't mess around with them too much, but they don't seem to have the, the same kind of issues that, I guess, plague the rotor wing side of things. Is it is it because they can control from both seats? Like, what's the, the hard part? That's part of it is, you know, who's actually, you know, in control of the aircraft. And then, of course, you know, the instrumentation of being synced up completely, mm. everything outside of the cockpit being synced up correctly. It's just a synchronization issue uh, mm. between the control system, the avionics systems, the weapon systems uh, and everything else. Okay. And then for the MI8, is that going to be seeing multi-crew anytime soon then with the release of the Hind? I, I don't know off the top of my head. I hope so. And I would imagine so, but it's not something I can commit to right now. All right. So we've got the Apache coming out later this year. Uh, I mean, I got to ask, when do you think that's going to go up on pre-order? Pre-order, if I remember right. Uh, actually, let me punt on that one because uh, okay. I can't remember <laughs> off the top of my head. And I want to say it now sure. and then be wrong and get grilled on it. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. Uh, but as far as from a development standpoint, you guys are on schedule. You think it's still going to be released this year? Yeah, we're definitely looking at Apache for early access before the end of this year. And I imagine, you know, a lot of the same things that you're going through with the Hind or just helping with the Apache. I mean, one team is talking to the other and kind of working itself out. How, how is uh, flight model development getting with, with helicopters? You know, I mean, I, you and I have talked about this before. This is one of the most challenging things, I think, uh, as a helicopter pilot and playing any sort of helicopter simulation is it just feels, a, a, it's hard, right, to capture that feeling. Mm -hmm. um, do, you guys, do you guys feel like as you've gone through this process before with the Huey and the MI8 that you're getting a better handle on it? Is it still just as challenging? Like, how does that work? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think the previous experience between the Huey and the MI8 has helped quite a bit of, you know, having our uh, flight model system for helicopters much more mature than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And when we take a look at, say, the flight model for the Hind, obviously there's going to be a fair amount of similarities, um, not as much with the aerodynamics, but naturally for the, uh, the engine systems, the avionics, hydraulics, which all actually wrap into the advanced flight model system. And, um, you know, those two are very similar in that regard. Uh, as for the Apache, it's more, uh, it's going to be a more difficult beast. There's uh, much more limited data, uh, in terms of, uh, flight model parameters, uh, to go by. So a lot of it's going to be uh, based on that limited data and then working with uh, SME subject matter experts mm -hmm. to do our best to get kind of the, as you mentioned, the feel for the aircraft as accurate as possible. And, you know, that's one of the most challenging things is you could have a ton of documents on, you know, the exact uh, flight parameters of a helicopter or fixed wing, but it usually really doesn't account for the feel of the aircraft. And until you actually have an operator to help out a bit, it's very difficult to capture that. And um, that's one of the reasons why uh, a couple of months ago, I put out a, um, a feeler for Apache pilots um, to help out if they'd like to do just that, to make sure that we got the feel for the aircraft as accurate as we can. How how difficult is it for you guys to get SMEs for for any of these aircraft? When you, I mean, do you normally put out the call, or I mean, how does that work, and that you manage to get the right people for those jobs? It kind of depends on the aircraft. So for mm -hmm. the Viper and the Hornet, uh, just over the years, I have um, quite a few friends in both of those communities. I was able to bring in and help out. Uh, the Apache was a lot more difficult for me uh, in that it just. You know, prior to doing this, I really didn't have any friends and contacts in that community. So mm -hmm. that kind of forced me to go to our community, which it's, you know, been a massive asset for us uh, in many different ways. But one of them has been, uh, you know, find the subject matter experts uh, to help out in such matters. And uh, we've got a really great group of uh, Apache SMEs right now that have been you know, outstanding in helping 
you know, find uh, images outside, inside the aircraft, um, help better understanding of general admin systems and so on. And then once we get to the flight model testing element, um, that work from them is going to be uh, critical uh, for us to, you know, again, get that kind of feel and the quirks uh, flying the Apache. So kind of circling back to AI, mission design, terrain, you know, DCS is is very good for the fixed wing world. Um, you know, I think the Persian Gulf map is a is a perfect example in my mind of here's a map that's very broad. It's 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 great for jets, but then you get down low and some of the terrain is just not there, right? There are certain towns that just aren't on the map. Sure. Syria, uh, I haven't found anything like that. I mean, Syria, mm -hmm. everywhere I've gone is fully developed. Yep. Was that uh, by design because we're getting into the helicopters and more low flying aircraft? Is it just by the nature of the developer? Like, like it just seemed to be a different, a change, uh, in my opinion, for the better, as far as maps go, was that by design or just kind of accidental? I think it's a combination of factors. Uh, one is uh, year by year, we start to increase the power and the capability of what we call our TDK or de uh, terrain development kit. And we mm -hmm. just have more capability to make these uh, maps more and more accurate. Uh, on top of that, we have the ability to put more and more detail into these maps while you know not completely uh, killing the frame rate. Yeah, of course, a map like Syria and the channel map uh, being so much more detailed, it's going to be a bigger load on the computer. But compared to years past, it's, uh, the system is much more efficient about rendering those scenes. The other big element, of course, is the third-party developer, uh, Ugra. Um, has done an outstanding job. Uh, they started with the Normandy map, which is a great map, but then they they took their capability and upped it 10 notches for the Syria map. And we're just uh, tickled pink about you know, the quality that they put into that map. And it's just gonna get better and better. With 2.7, they're adding a bunch of new airfields and landmarks and detail into that map. And then post 2.7, then they'll be uh, adding a, a quite a bit to the map of the uh, eastern portions of uh, Syria uh, bordering mm -hmm. onto Iraq, uh, portions of uh, Turkey on the southern part, and then, of course, uh, Cyprus. Uh, people have been really clamoring for uh, that to be part of the map. And, um, you know, all in all, it, this map, it's already really good, but it's going it's to get better and better. Mm -hmm. And you combine the great work that uh, that team is doing with what we can do with the TDK right now. Um, yeah, I'm pretty pleased with where we're on that, on that now. And then of course, we have the, uh, the Marianas map, which is gonna have, you know, I dare say, even a higher level of detail, which I think people are really gonna enjoy. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. Did I read something that you guys are gonna have two versions of that map? Is it gonna be like a modern and then a World War II era one, or am I, am I wrong nope, on you're, that? you're exactly right. So we're starting okay. with a modern day map in that, uh, so it'll be naturally Guam, Saipan, Tinian, Rhoda, and a couple other smaller islands. Mm -hmm. um, and at, you know, just excruciating detail, I think literally down to house to house, um, the mm -hmm. team has um, been gone into this map. And, you know, the cool thing about this is particularly you pair that with the Chinese assets pack. You know, there's a lot of really cool modern day uh, single mission and campaign capabilities, but even more so the way the map is laid out with the island structures with uh, Guam in the south and Saipan up in the north and then the other islands in between. You have a really nice natural setup of bases for competitive multiplayer, which I think mm -hmm. is going to be a lot of fun. But then taking that map, uh, the basic uh, structure of it, the mesh, uh, the assets we built for it, uh, then it's you know, that was the heavy lifting part. You know, then we can take that and then convert that to a World War II map. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, in that case, it's mostly you know getting rid of you know a huge amount of the roads, the buildings, the airfields. Um, and you know, for this map, this is before. Um, those, ma those uh, islands were essentially uh, taken over in mm. you know, huge bases, particularly when a Tinian was built. So it's mostly just jungle at that point. So mm. it shouldn't be a huge amount of work. But the much bigger aspect of that map is then going to be the related assets 
for both uh, U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, and of course the uh, Japanese forces. And that's going to be actually a really huge task, uh, particularly when we talk about the naval forces. Yeah. What, so maybe you mentioned it, I didn't catch what, what is the proposed timeline for that, that Mariana's map? Well, the Mariana's map modern day will be this year. Uh, I don't really have a date on the World War II one. Yeah, well, I mean, the Syria map is amazing. I, I really enjoy it. Um, just flying around, it, it really did remind me of being in that part of the world. Uh, so it was really well done. So for you to say that the, the Mariana's map is even even better in detail is, is pretty exciting. So that, that's yeah. good stuff. Um, cause yeah, as we, as we go th into these, you know, more helicopter modules, that, that terrain matters more than when you're at 20,000 feet zipping yeah, around. Absolutely. So, so that's good to hear. And, and I know that the, the helicopter fans will, will, will be enjoying that. And another big element of these terrains with this much higher level detail, it gives us the capability to revisit combined arms. And mm. there's been several big items that have been kind of holding combined arms back. Uh, one, of course, has been the damage modeling systems for the ground units. Uh, another big one has been the detail of that terrain. So mm. uh, particularly with the TDK, we're you know, getting close to the point where we have such a detailed uh, terrain that it's going to make more sense to uh, beef up com combined arms again. And uh, as you're, you know, going off tangent here, but as you're probably aware, we've been spending a lot of time uh, doing the damage model system for the World War II aircraft, and then we're going to move to the more modern aircraft, and mm -hmm. then we're going to be going to the ships and the ground units. So yeah. uh, in time, you know, we'll have the ground units up to spec for a really great damage modeling system, and combined with more detailed terrain, um, you know, at that point, that's when really combined arms can start to really shine. Yeah, no, well, I mean, you, I was literally going to ask you next question about combined arms. Um, so I'm glad that you brought it up because I, I think that's certainly something as we just, again, push down lower. Um, I think combined arms could definitely use a facelift. Understanding, yeah. too, that, you know, I mean, I don't know your balance sheet, but I imagine that's not a money maker anyway. And so you've got to you've got to put resources where they're going to make you the most bang for your buck. Um I don't think most people look at DSAS and say, well, it's a good tank simulator. And that's not right. really your intention or design. No, uh, but there's certainly some great functionality that, that can be can be added to that um, without turning it into, you know, Arma. I, I know some people have talked about, well, I wish you could, you know, have the troop, you know, be the troops or something like that. I, I don't think that's anything on the horizons. But w when we get into more helicopters and, and admittedly, a lot of helicopters are really focused on the transport side of things. Um, I guess it just is encouraging to see that there's some effort and, and there's still a view towards combined arms because there is a lot more functionality that you can get with the MI8 and the Huey and, you know, whatever else you guys have planned. Absolutely. Yeah. By no means is combined arms abandoned. It's just more been put on a bit of a back burner sure. as we have the other systems brought up to speed to better support it. Again, uh, damage modeling and terrain in particular. Well, awesome. I, you know, again, I just kind of wanted to touch base with you on some helicopter stuff because I, I think that there's a lot of excitement. I mean, I th what was the MI-8 was the last helicopter, I think, released uh, yeah, on DCS, be. and that's been several years. Yeah. So, uh, you know, for guys like me, it's it's super exciting to see it kind of put back into the forefront for a little bit. And, uh, you know, these are some great titles the Hind. I mean, that's iconic. The Apache, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually the Kiowa, uh, which is getting worked on by Polychop, yep. And I guess Razbam is working on a, a 105. So, yep. Absolutely. and then you're talking about, there's some other things in the work. So there are, uh, yeah, I think for the helicopter side of things, that's very exciting, uh, news. And then, uh, the dynamic campaign generator too, is I think that's one of those things that's going to make a lot of people happy. So it's, it's good to hear that that's being, being worked on. So absolutely. Cause it's, it's one thing to have a great simulator. It's a different thing to have a good game. And uh, right now we need to hit both of those. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's challenging work, and anyone who thinks that this stuff is easy is is just not paying attention, and and, <laughs> and yeah, needs yeah, to maybe well. take a chill pill on it because it it is hard work. I mean, just the little bit that I've helped out with with Polyjob and just mm -hmm. kind of understanding what goes on behind closed doors on that stuff, man, that is hard. It is. And uh, and then when you start adding and just just the flight model alone for helicopters is just incredibly difficult to to yeah. to get it right. Um, and I think too, you got to find that balance of it's got to be right, but it's also got to be fun. Cause at the end of the day, it is a game. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, no one's getting their pri- their pilot's license <laughs> doing this. Uh, so you got to find that that happy balance of where it feels right enough, but you can still pick it up and have fun with it on day one or maybe day two, you know, <laughs> gotcha. depending on what you're trying to do with the helicopters. But yeah. um, well, I mean, any last words that you want to have for people listening as far as just the direction that we're going with DCS right now? Well, like you said, you know, this year is going to be a really big one for us, you know, between 2.7, multiple helicopters, uh, wrapping up the Hornet, uh, putting a lot more resources back into the Viper to really accelerate that product. Uh, It's going to be a big year for us. Uh, A lot of great things coming down the pipe. And, um, you know, I hope you guys enjoy the ride. Well, I appreciate you coming on and talking about it with us and uh, look forward to having some some talks with you again in the future when uh, we get to hind out and the patchy's around the corner. So thanks a lot. You bet, Casmo. Happy to join. Mm-hmm.